These are something called the ten paramis, or ten perfections of character. And they're very commonly recited in Asian countries, less in the West, but I think I'd like to introduce people to these because they're a very complete set of practices. And it can help you rethink the, the Noble Eightfold Path, like the normal, the normal uh, structure of the teachings of the Buddha is usually presented as the Noble Eightfold Path. <clears throat> but these paramis, or cultivations of character, can give you a new frame of reference for the path. The reason why is that all of these ten are said to ha must, that they must be developed. Before one is finished the path, one has to develop these to a high state. <clears throat> and that's why they're called perfections. Now, a little bit about the background of these. One thing uh, you might be surprised, or you might not be surprised, to find that they are not a list in the Pali Canon. The, the core suttas, the longer length, middle length, connected sayings, and the numbered sayings, do not include the ten paramis. They're found in uh, commentarial, uh, literature, and however, they are found individually scattered throughout the, the Pali Canon, and they were simply not collected as a unit um, in the Pali Canon, but they become very important in the commentarial teachings later on as a unit, and it becomes a very, very important unit of teaching. But in case you wonder where these things are in the Theravada, in the Pali Canon, they are um, fully developed uh, and uh, number 10, uh, long before the Mahayana um, come out with the six paramis. So <clears throat> it's something prior to the Mah Mahayana Sutras and uh, these have uh, more or less three levels. The, the level of the Arahant, the level of what's called a Pacheka Buddha, and the level of a Samasambuddha, a fully enlightened Buddha. Now, uh, the famous stories, which you may or may not be familiar with, of what, how did the Buddha get to be the Buddha? Who was he before he was the Buddha? He became the Buddha at 35 on a specific night of the full moon, so they say. And he had been practicing diligently on, in various schools for the previous six years. And at that time, before he is the Buddha, which is just a title, it's, a, it's not his name, it's a title, more or less translated as the Awakened One, um, he is referred to as the Bodhisattva. And that is a, a one aspiring to enlightenment. So he, before he is that, that night of awakening, he is not is said not to be enlightened. He has been seeking enlightenment. And then the, the history goes in, there's lots of uh, literature on the prior lives of the Buddha. <clears throat> they, they arrive in the form of the Jataka tales, uh, birth tales, prior life tales. And these go back an incredible amount of time. They they are mind-bogglingly um, uh, distant in the past. So these, uh, <clears throat> there are 555 Jataka tales uh, in the canon. Uh, they're very interesting. Uh, some of them obviously are more or less folk tales uh, illustrating a moral 
kind of like Aesop's fables. Uh, they're quite, some of them are quite wild. Um, the, the Bodhisattva appears not only in human form in, in different lives, but it, as an animal in certain lives. And sometimes he's a, a married householder, sometimes he's a, an ascetic yogi living alone in the forest, um, cultivating various things. But what's he doing in these lives? What he's doing is cultivating these paramis, these ten perfections of character. And in order to arrive at this exalted condition of a perfectly enlightened Buddha, it takes an enormous length of time. And uh, he has determined in the far distant past that he is going to cultivate and develop these paramis. And it's a staggering amount of time uh, required. And, but you get these little very interesting stories about working on one particular uh, virtue at a time. Now, we are not all aiming for Buddhahood. Uh, by the way, you need to get straight that there are different schools of Buddhism. The, primary, the largest uh, two schools are the Theravada and the Mahayana. The Mahayana has a, has a spectrum of, of different schools within it. Theravada is fairly uniform and, and relies mostly on the earliest uh, suttas. Notice the word sutta instead of sutra. So when you come across a sutra, you're probably looking at a Mahayana uh, discourse. Uh, whereas you come across a sutta, you're looking at the, at the earliest, the, the Pali canon, the uh, teach, the basic teachings of what's called the Theravada school. So, um, in the Theravada, you will not hear much about the... The Buddha does not teach the Bodhisattva path. He sometimes refers to his past as a Bodhisattva, but he doesn't lay out and advocate the idea of of traveling along or taking the path that he took on this bodhisattva path. That tends to be a feature later on of the Mahayana, uh, but is not at all emphasized or the Buddha does not discourse on taking up the bodhisattva path in the, in the Pali Canon. However, it is, uh, one cannot arrive at the state of enlightenment uh, which would be, the final enlightenment would be called Arahant. So those disciples of the Buddha are aspiring at the time to being becoming Arahants. And even to today, the sort of highest aspiration in the Theravada school is primarily the drive towards this Arahantship. Uh, I mentioned one other word in there about the levels of development, a Pacheka Buddha. And we don't have any, in, in our times, we don't have any Pacheka Buddhas that we know of, but in certain times in history, there's supposed to be people who are deeply enlightened, as deeply enlightened as the Buddha himself, but who are not able to formulate the teaching in a charismatic way in order to develop a, a religion around it, a, a, what we call the sasana. You know, I'm borrowing these words, these English words, religion and so forth, which may be inappropriate to apply to Buddhism in, in the same way. It's not, it is not one of the uh, Abrahamic religions. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have the same form as Judaism or Islam or Christianity. It has a different form. <clears throat> and that that, but the structure of the, the whole teaching of the Buddha and the, and the people that are influenced by it and the people who carry on the teaching, that general package is called the sasana. And this is uh, quite a, a feat to establish a sasana. And it requires a great charisma and the capacity to organize large groups of people that in a, in a way where the structure will persist 
for enormous lengths of time. Now we're 2,500 years into this sasana and it's still going strong. It's still flourishing, still spreading throughout the world, in fact. So it's, it's been going well for a long time and it's partly because of the organizational structure and the, the clarity of the teachings. This is somewhat beyond the capacity of the so-called Pacheka Buddha. The Buddha, the Pacheka Buddha, this, Pacheka means silent, silent Buddha. So one, one, one awakens by oneself and then, but does not propagate the teachings. So this is interesting to notice that this is possible. One can awaken and choose or be not up to the task of disseminating the material. Uh, this, you think of musicians, perhaps, where they can play, but they, they're, not, they're really not able to communicate or teach what they can do. This happens in lots of different areas, arts, and you, you can develop skills and, and enormous levels of capacity, but you can't, you're, not a, you're not able to teach it or pass it along. That's another, it's a separate area of personal development. So... These are the three levels of development. And I think I want to talk about the, the perfections themselves. And let me just kind of give you a list of them. Uh, the first one is usually listed as sila, which means, or dana, sorry, uh, as generosity. And then virtuous behavior, which is called sila. The third is nekama. And that's renunciation. I'll explain these more in depth, but renunciation. And panya is wisdom. Virya is energy or right effort. Kanti, patience. Satcha, truth, meaning truth in uh, speech being truthful with oneself, being truthful with others, Satcha. Aditana is uh, determination. Uh, that is to make a resolution, a determination, and to carry it out. Metta is loving kindness, friendliness, which is, of course, famously taught in the Buddhist schools. Upeka is equanimity. That is also taught. Not as, it doesn't get star billing of metta. But upeka is this uh, sterling quality of balance in the midst of the variety of experiences in life. And so these are the ten paramis, and they're very useful. You can, you can choose to practice, you know, feature one in your life, or you could take it up for a year at a time. You could just work on your... Generosity. So the first one is generosity. Now it's, I don't think it's an accident that it's the first one usually in the list. I think generosity is most available to everybody. I think even a child, like um, a three-year-old, or can practice generosity. Uh, you know, you could, they, they'll share a cookie or share the toys. And, uh, and they should be uh, maybe taught to do this as well. And they can be taught to do this. Uh, it's, it occurs very early in uh, human development, the idea of generosity. The others are more sophisticated and, and difficult, but the root, it's kind of a root quality. Of course, you'll see this in every religious teaching, every teaching of wisdom. There, there, are, no, there are no wise schools which do not advocate generosity. So it's a core... Um, a valuable aspect of human experience. You enrich yourself through the development of generosity. And when it is not developed, when the opposite is, is developed, miserliness or stinginess, the, the hoarding um, instinct, and then it, it becomes a, a, a defect in the personality. It is very, there's something lacking in the, in the person uh, when they have no instinct for generosity and they become admirable and um, uh, appreciated uh, when a person is generous uh, other humans are inspired by that and uh, uplifted by that and uh, 
they, they sometimes, when they see an example of that, they, they also like to emulate it. And then when they, when they do that, of course, you have to have the spirit of generosity as well. It's not merely the action of, of giving. It's, it's, it's with the right motivation. And Buddhism uh, ex goes into the, how do you develop this, uh, this parami, this perfection of character of, of generosity. Now, with, they have the stories of the historical Buddha uh, where he, he really has to give everything away uh, in order to, be, to arrive at fully, enlight, fully enlightened Buddha, a sama sambuddha. This perfection has to be um, uh, developed to the highest state. Um, and so he, they give him uh, stories, and the stories are absolutely riveting. And these stories um, of the, say, the life before he becomes the Buddha and the immediate past life of that is a Jataka uh, story that is, is often acted out on stage in Asia. And it is, uh, sometimes the roles are even played by monks and novices. In uh, Thailand, they sometimes have novices play the woman's role in the story because they have high voices. They <laughs> this is common throughout all of drama, you know, Shakespeare, the women's roles were often played by men and so forth. There's a, the women were somehow not thought to be appropriate to be on stage. So in, in a lot of traditional theater around the world, all roles are played by men. Um, but so you see this, uh, when you think of Buddhism in the West, you, you, if you think at all about monks, you, you imagine them sitting in, in full lotus under a tree and... Uh, watching their breath or solemnly, maybe going on alms round, but there's a huge culture as well in Asia where monks are doing all kinds of things and they're, one of them is to uh, communicate through the medium of the stage even. Now, I'm gonna suddenly um, interrupt and make, your, make you self-conscious. That's what I'm doing right now. What, you're, you're watching me on stage talking to you, aren't you? <laughs> in this very video. <laughs> and I'm telling you stories about the Buddha's past life. <clears throat> so I guess we're still, uh, that's what monks are still doing. <laughs> so um, the, the, that particular story is, is, is disturbing. It's actually disturbing. It's, so, it's, it's a very, crafted, well-crafted story, but the, the, the Bodhisattva at that time actually has to give away his, he has a wife and two children, a boy and a girl. And it's the final end of the development of perfection of generosity. So he is asked for his children and he gives them away. <laughs> he gives away his wife and children when somebody asks for them. It's very disturbing. Uh, you think, what? That's irresponsible. That's, how can, you know, on and on. It's, a, it's an enchanting and uh, disturbing story. And it, I think it's very well crafted in order to disturb you and so you cannot forget the story. <laughs> and you also think, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. Um, so that these, uh, these paramis are all taught in uh, various stories and parables and um, similes and metaphors and analogies. Uh, so there's a whole rich literature of it. And so you should, you can get, if you're practicing one of these things, you should expose yourself to this. And, you know, have stories that you refer to. When you want to cultivate your generosity, uh, find stories of people um, being generous and sharing. Uh, sharing things even when they don't have much um, so there's that you get inspired by that in the uh, in the Catholic tradition they have uh, Saint Francis and uh, he establishes this as a kind of order which is more or less uh, concerned for the poor and he's, he's kind of a love saint and uh, 
he he organized a few men go for he's from a, actually from a very wealthy family so he has to renounce all his wealth as, as well and do a um, take up poverty a life of deliberate poverty but and a, a continuous practice of generosity as well. We'll, we'll talk a little later about this uh, renunciation. It's different than generosity. Renunciation and generosity are different. But he has a, a monk, a fellow monk, that named uh, uh, Brother Juniper. And uh, Brother Juniper is a bit of a character. Uh, and of course, he's they're trying to live up to this injunction of generosity. So. Brother Juniper, they, and the, the Franciscans at the time only had one robe, so they, they just had a, a coarse, single robe. But they would go out also on alms round, just like Buddhist monks. Uh, they would go to the village for, to receive food. And a beggar, at that time, of course, this is the 12th century AD, poverty was everywhere and uh, leprosy and all of this. Anyway, a beggar had no uh, no cloak, no shirt, and he he saw the friar and he said, "Do you have any clothes for? It? Can you give me any clothes?" And that's so Brother Juniper took off his his cloak, stark naked, and gave it to the beggar and came back naked to the monastery. And so Brother Juniper walks in naked and they think, Brother, <laughs> what are you up to here? <laughs> he says, well, somebody asked, didn't have some clothes, so I just gave it away. Oh, oh, well, let's get you a robe, you know. And um, so they got him a robe. And anyway, a week later, he came back naked again. So then <laughs> the Franciscan rule is you cannot give that robe away. You're not allowed to do that. Generosity is appropriate under certain circumstances, but do not make, do not go naked. So um, there is, there's generosity and there's uh, appropriate generosity and then there's idiot generosity and <laughs> there's a various spectrums of generosity. So you see that it's, it's not just uh, in, in the Buddhist practice, but you should cultivate that. Sila is the next one, and it's a, a practice of virtuous behavior. That is, and you know, the summary is the five precepts. So not to kill, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to lie, and not to uh, use intoxicants that weaken your uh, clarity or mindfulness. And so these are kind of, uh, so one should uh, not, uh, not only abstain from killing, I mean, the, the boundaries would be killing, but obviously at the higher development also would be non-harm. And uh, speech, is, and of course, honoring other people's possessions, you're not, you're not taking what is not yours. I mean, that that's done in all kinds of ways. Uh, sometimes in in cheating with measurements and in the business world and so forth, there's uh, ways of stepping over the boundaries, and so one does not do that. And sexual misconduct is is really not about sex. It's about uh, com uh, not transgressing other people's relationships. So if, if people have a, an exclusive relationship, you just uh, honor that and don't intrude on that. S the, the, li the, li the last one is lying, but actually it involves more than just false speech and full awareness. Uh, there are other types of speech which are part of virtuous behavior to abstain from harsh speech from malicious speech. Malicious speech is, uh, uh, which is, attempts to divide people or pit them against each other. So um, this can be very, uh, it's a very problematic type of strategy and speech, you know. And then gossip, uh, frivolous gossip uh, is, uh, is a form of wrong speech as well. 
So one tries to upgrade their, the structures of their speech to be, have some integrity, some kindness, some honest, honesty. But honesty with a sense of appropriateness as well, not merely blurting out the truth all the time. Because there's sometimes when it's inappropriate, the timing is not right. So these are skills to, to develop. Nekama is renunciation. And that's what monks uh, and nuns do. Uh, that renunciation is you renounce the household life and you go forth into the, the monastic life. And renunciation is different than generosity. So you're just uh, letting go of these things. You're not necessarily giving them away or sharing them. You're just abandoning them. Uh, there are stories at the time of just people just dumping their gold in a river and just walking away, you know. So uh, that's different than giving out the gold coins to the poor or whatever, but just walking away. There's The Buddha himself, as a, as a prince, he walks away from the palace. He walks away. In, the, in, the, in the, the life that we have of the Bodhisattva, he, he has a child and a wife. And he is a prince. He's probably destined to become the king. He has a whole family. He, he doesn't give them away, but he just leaves. And so this is a very different story than the, the previous story, the disturbing story of him giving his children away. <laughs> this one, he doesn't give his children away. He just walks away. That disturbs people too. Is, it, is he not a deadbeat dad? <laughs> he, well, I left his... It, on the night of his son's birth, he leaves. Uh, he walks out and renounces everything into absolute poverty and uncertainty. So that's renunciation. And renunciation is the aspiration to freedom. Is to say, look, there's high, there's high value in human life, and we there are limits to what I want to be burdened with. And when I find that, they're all, that things are burdening my freedom, uh, my highest aspiration, and it's not just mere self-indulgence. It's not the freedom of self-indulgence. It's, it's the, what humans should aspire to is um, well-being and uh, not to be burdened like a mule in this life, you know, unnecessarily burdened. They are aspiring to lightness of being and freedom and that that makes it worth living. And so renunciation is an important thing and we can't just be accumulating things and holding on to things and all we need. Uh, and somebody who renounces these kind of things or renounces the pursuit of wealth or of, of fame or all of these things uh, is also a, a blessing to others because these things, if they're... If there is no other language, then uh, accumulate, be famous, do all this. It's a terrible stress and burden. And to hear of somebody saying, that uh, doesn't interest me. <laughs> that uh, uplifts the human heart. Uh, not everybody can hear this. Not everybody understands that. Lots of people... What you 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 gave, you you gave it away? You walked away? How can you how can you do that? That's all I think about all day. I want that's what I want. See, now that person is, in a sense, devaluing it by just saying oh, there are. That's not the. Those are side effects. You know, that's not the point of the experience. So um, and the next is uh, wisdom, and wisdom is only wisdom if it addresses one particular situation. It's not intelligence, it's wisdom. And wisdom is different than intelligence. Intelligence can answer questions. So you write an IQ test, and you just sit down there, and whatever question they ask you, you try to answer. It's interesting. Are you sure you're spending your time well? <laughs> Right, you know, they just say, "I'm going to give you a crossword puzzle or whatever," they, and you're you're willing to to invest your life in some stranger asking you to answer random questions. 
Are you sure you want to do that? Is that the best use of your time? Um, now, wisdom is, is asking, what is the best use of my time? In other words, what question is important to me? Not, I'm not interested in any answering any questions, only certain questions. Um, now, the amount of questions in the, that are available to humans are infinite, aren't they? They're, just think about science. Just in physics, they can just go on examining the matter that stuff is made out of for, <laughs> forever. The mathematical questions, the math. These are endless, aren't they? But where do they go ultimately? Are they the best use of your time? Or should you be trying to answer the question, how, how do I reduce suffering? How do I increase my well-being? This, this is an important question. And science really can't decide which is the most important question. They can just answer questions with a scientific method, but they can't say which one is the most important. That's a, that's a totally human aspect. So panya is this capacity to ask, actually, how do you develop panya? Panya is developed, wisdom is developed by asking questions. And by the way, does anybody have any questions while I'm talking here? If you do, please put your hand up and I will endeavor to answer the questions. The next one is virya, and that's energy and effort. And it is the most frequently repeated factor in the Buddhist teaching. So you'll hear all kinds of things mentioned, loving kindness and insight and with effort gets the first billing. Mindfulness and so forth is quite out frequently mentioned, but effort is gets the first billing. <clears throat> There's a structure uh, of course, it's one of the f uh, factors of the Eightfold Path. It's called right effort. And um, there are uh, four, four types of right effort. One is to prevent the arising of the uh, hindrances, the, the psychic irritants, the negative emotions, to prevent them. The next one is to, if they have arisen, to remove them. The third one is... The, to deal with the beautiful factors, uh, the beautiful qualities of life, the in factors of enlightenment. And that is your duty to, to bring them into existence and then to deepen and sustain them. So this is called right effort. And uh, this is uh, a full-time job, really. Um, and, but it's one that you, it's a career that you will not regret. Uh, the amount of energy that you can pour into this single question, how do I reduce human suffering, uh, starting with my own and increasing my understanding, and then possibly I can share uh, my experiences with others, but uh, we have to make an, uh, a great deal of intelligent effort <clears throat> to do this. So virya is... Um, and a, and a, a strong alertness, and a uh, diligence, and awareness um, at all times. Kanti is patience, and patience. Uh, one of the th one of the things the Buddha tells his disciples very early in life, in the in the in the development of this of the sasana. <clears throat> He's speaking to a whole group of former ascetics <clears throat> that were doing extreme practices. Uh, they, were, they were doing fire worship and torment of the body and things like this. And they had converted to Buddhism. And he gives a famous uh, discourse to them called the Ovada Pati Moka. Uh, Ovada is a uh, a discourse and on, on on the discipline, on the structure, and it's a, it's fairly simple. But one of the things is he, the phrase is, kanti paramang, 
Uttamang. Kanti, patience, is the highest virtue. Uh, what he's doing is redirecting them. They had thought that spiritual development or purification occurs through the infliction of desperate, you know, hard practice of pain. Uh, to inflict pain on yourself deliberately somehow purifies you. And doing these extraordinary extreme practices, this, this creeps up in all kinds of religious practices. You get famously saints whipping themselves. And the Buddha is saying, you got it wrong here. That practice is not, uh, that, that goes in the wrong direction. The, bo the body is not, the, not at fault. The body is innocent. So I want you to practice patience instead. Patience is the highest virtue. Now what is patience? Patience is, abs is the absence of s stress. It's not, it's not an act of, of tension. To be patient is not an act of tension. It's actually to release tension. And he gives a, uh, a, an ex uh, kind of a parable of this or a simile. He says, as the great earth does not react whatever is thrown upon it, so one who is patient does not react to loathsome things that are cast upon one. Patience endures as the great earth, the garbage and loathsome things are thrown upon it. It does not react. One, one needs to make oneself very large and realize that it's a high possibility in this life that garbage will come your way. <laughs> loathsome things will be cast upon you. Patience is to not have a problem with that. And that, the, you're not taught this. You're, you're taught commiseration with, uh, you know, uh, how do you last, how do you endure this? The Buddha is saying, uh, no problem. It's, that stuff happens. And you have to know that you have the freedom of choice to not have a problem with that. So patience is not gritting your teeth and lasting. Satcha is truth, and that's a absolutely central and critical. If we don't, if we stray from the truth, bad things happen. Truth is a, like you you have a faculty of truth more or less that can be damaged if if you do not describe reality to yourself in the proper way you can damage your capacity to describe reality to yourself. And of course you see this all the time. Uh, we're, this is, we're in the middle of a, this American uh, election stuff um, uh, with a great deal of flinging around this, this word lying. <laughs> uh, well, the consequences of misrepresenting reality are grave grave uh, because it's a precious and delicate uh, faculty and if we abuse it we may not be able to get it back uh, you lose your ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy even though, so pathological liars will often be unable to tell whether they are lying or not anymore you also, <laughs> as you, as you, um, as you tell a uh, fabricate lies, quite often it's in order to be convincing, you have to kind of believe it yourself. It goes down the wrong circuit, and then that circuit gets a little bit damaged or opened up, and in fact, you you begin to have amnesia, uh, a form of amnesia about who you are. If you misrepresent yourself to others, then you can't remember who you actually are. You can't find your way back on the, um, you lose your way. So, it's important to be able to find your way out. You know, there's a story in uh, 
the Greek literature about uh, Theseus and the Minotaur. And Theseus has to go into this labyrinth. Uh, this Minotaur, this half man, half beast thing, has been causing great havoc in the village. And uh, people have attempted to go into the labyrinth and uh, deal with it, but they don't come out. They get lost in the labyrinth. It's a very frightening uh, story, isn't it? It's this dark, winding series of misleading tunnels, and at the center of it is something that is half human, half animal, and it causes trouble. <laughs> You're Somebody has to go in there and deal with that. Uh, but they get lost in the maze. Uh, Theseus manage, is in, wise, intelligent, and ties a thread on his wrist, or, and a long thread. So he goes into the maze, but he, he uh, can find his way out because the thread, uh, he just has to walk backwards through the thread. He does not lose the thread of sanity. So this is what, of course, this, this journey, what is it? Everybody has to do it. At the center of our psyche is something that's not quite always human. <laughs> it's wavers. This is what we call in modern times the old brain, you know, the animal brain, the reactive brain. It bursts out, causes trouble from time to time. And uh, then we have to deal with it. We have to go in there, but we have to go into our own mind. And the mind is full of fantasy and delusions. And it's a maze, a labyrinth, and it's very easy to get lost in there. <clears throat> uh, these days we have guides, you know. You've you got your psychiatrist or your psychologist or your spiritual mentor and so forth that are helping to guide you through the confusion of these, this labyrinth so that you can confront this thing that is impulsive, is irrational, and so forth. And you can, like, if you're like Theseus, you will stick the sword through the heart of it and <laughs> find your way back out. <laughs> and there'll be peace in the, peace. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, Sacha truth is very, very important. Aditana is determination, and this is uh, what you do every New Year is you make your resolutions, and then, of course, they, they last for a, a week or a month. <laughs> Aditana is it's very good. By the way, you know, don't hesitate. Even if you failed in making resolutions and not carrying them out, don't, uh, don't discard the, the idea. Uh, the capacity to make resolutions and carry them out are, is an exercise. And you should every now and then just take, make a week, uh, something that you can easily do, that 99% sure that you can manage to do it. You just say, I'm not going to drink more than two coffees for the next two days, you know. Uh, something easy to do. Practice with easy resolutions and then try some middle ones uh, that you, well, you got about a 50-50 chance of pulling this one off. Uh, do that. Uh, every time you, you practice it, and it's not harmful to fail in these. You, and, and it's, uh, you, you should not get the idea that if I'm, if I'm not going to be able to do this successfully, I'm not going to make the determination. Uh, now, there's a chance that you will be able to pull it off. And it builds up as a, as a capacity over time, so you exercise determination. And then there's the last one, the really hard ones, uh, that, you know, 90% chance of failure, 95% chance of failure, even 99% chance of failure. Make those as well. Every now and then, determine. Make a 99, uh, that, that you're, you know, you know like, yeah, what am I saying? I, I'm not going to be able to do this. Uh, but that's all right. That's all right. What I want you to know is, is that you have a realistic sense of what you have a chance of doing and what you don't have a chance of doing. R realistic, you, you, you get to know yourself, but you get to know yourself only by trying to do these things. And even if you fail at them, 
That's not a failure. That's part of the development. Certain things are out of your capacity at this time. Doesn't mean that you cannot make the endeavor to, to do these. And the, the failure is not a failure. It's, it's part of the, uh, the strengthening of this capacity. Metta is, of course, famously loving kindness. And uh, the Buddha says, the best state of mind in all the world. So uh, if we can, and it's expansive, it's the unconditional loving kindness. And it enriches your life. It has endless benefits. And uh, it, it improves all of your relationships to others. It improves your well-being and health, your mental well-being. It is a protective, uh, particularly protective. Loving kindness is a, is a protection. And it's strange because you, you'd think hostility or anger or something is how you protect yourself, but actually it's not how you protect yourself. It's how you poison yourself. <laughs> Your anger and, and having a sense of a, aggressive uh, or paranoia or any of these things are, are destructive of yourself. And uh, they can, it can do what your worst enemy cannot do to you. Loving kindness is the opposite, and it's protective. Uh, you feel safe when you have loving kindness. Is the essence of, of loving kindness is safety. This is what your mother, so the Buddha says, as a mother loves and protects her child, her only child. Now what the child has uh, experienced the mother's love as safety as a sense of safety. And so this is, uh, you will induce a sense of safety and, and confidence in yourself if you practice loving kindness. Upeka is equanimity, is balance, and that's a, like the philosopher's virtue. This is what you hear about Socrates and uh, uh, being a very equanimous, Sometimes they would use the word apathetic. Uh, it has a different meaning in modern times. In their times, apathy, the, the Greek word apathy, apathos, meant not, path, not pathetic. Uh, they, he thought, you know, people get so swept away in these little dramas, melodramas. It's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> it's pathos. And the higher person, the more developed person, is not pathetic. It's not, is not swept away in pathos. Is outside of pathos, apathetic. And um, but this became, this becomes later on a, a bad word for for indifferent or I don't care. So the uh, the real m meaning of the upeka is this equanimity. Equanimity is not swept away, and it, the simile is similar to uh, to to patience. Remember, for patience, the as the great earth does not react when loathsome things are thrown upon it. Equanimity is as the great earth does not react whatever is thrown upon it, because sometimes roses and flower petals are thrown upon earth but sometimes garbage is it's it's actually a, a wider spectrum than just patience it also allows you to be not swept away by praise and success and good fortune uh, this can be as dangerous as bad fortune if you are carried away by it you are a, a sterling character who is balanced in the middle of the teeter-totter. Sometimes you're praised. Sometimes you're blamed. Are you non-reactive in both situations? By the way, it's very hard to just enjoy praise but not be moved by blame. <laughs> so you really are fooling yourself. If you, you have to deal with both sides of the teeter-totter. And these are the eight worldly winds. Sometimes the that you're successful, sometimes you fail. Sometimes you're praised, sometimes you're blamed. By the way, individuals respond to different... Some, some people don't care whether they're blamed. They want a success. And they will, they will risk blame. Others are... They will not 
uh, risk uh, their uh, being blamed. Uh, even if it means not being successful, they will. It means more. Their opinion of others means more to them than um, <clears throat> being successful and so forth. So everybody has their little uh, thing on the teeter totter. Uh, sometimes it's it's praise and blame, success and failure, good fortune, bad fortune, etc. So uh, that are, those are those are the ten paramis. And they're developed at three levels. And so all of us have to develop all 10 of those to a substantial degree in order to come to the end of the samsara. We do not have to become the Buddha or a Buddha, um, either a Pacheka Buddha or a fully enlightened Buddha, but we, uh, in order to become Arahant, to be finished the project, we need to actually develop all of these things. And you will see that they kind of integrate into the path, the Eightfold Path. So this is a, kind of a brief overview of these 10 paramis, which are fascinating. And uh, I think in uh, future, I will, I will go through each of these paramis and, and develop and give all the details of them for now. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to say, but if not, we will call it a tea time. Hey John, so now you were talking about the, the teeter totter yes. of, uh, of failure or praise. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a constant judgment about yourself over something that you've done, mm -hmm. how do you bring balance? A practical question so that the, you're not <clears throat> a little bit more balance on the teeter-totter. Yes, so interior praise and blame. If you are the one that praises and blames yourself, um, there is a wholesome uh, version of this, and it's called Hiri Otapa, a, an appropriate sense of concern for the opinion of others, and a wholesome sense of fear about not doing things which will injure you. So it is not that we're indifferent to the inner voices. If we have, if we have unwholesome, some sort of unwholesome habit, we should um, develop, uh, we should say to ourselves, now what would the wise think of this, you know? Uh, we should be motivated by that. Uh, they would say, you should get over that, you know. So we should listen to it. <clears throat> However, we should try to bring a little bit of um, selflessness into this as well. This, uh, con our mind is quite conditioned, you know, we're, we're born in a very conditioned way. We have all kinds of quirks and habits. Uh, and it's not our mind, it's the mind. This is na the curious nature of mind. You know, we, we shouldn't personalize this so much. We don't know where our mind came from. We don't know how it works. We don't know how our body works. To say it's our body is not really true. It's, certain, it's the product of nature, isn't it? It's a product of the laws of biology. It just grows. We don't know how it works. <laughs> we don't, we don't uh, operate our own heartbeat or anything. It was just, it's, it's a thing that grows. <clears throat> and the mind is like this too. It's a, a marvelous complex mechanism that, that it has no name. And has, but wise people have observed its tendencies. So they're they're kind of psychologists, studiers of the mind. So we 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 should get some uh, some distance from this. We should have some objectivity about this mind thing. And uh, in order to do that, we we need to say it's not it's not about me. It's just the, the nature of mind as it works. Right, so this um, this this is how to approach this inner voice. So if I have a fault, 
I regard it wisely. How do I know I'm regarding my fault wisely? Because anger and aversion does not arise. How do I know I'm regarding my fault unwisely? Because anger and aversion rises. Therefore, I, I am doing it unskillfully. So it's fine to observe your faults and to aspire to correct them. But if it's accompanied by ill will, it is unwise attention to the fault. And that's how you know it's unwise. So you say, okay, cancel that. Um, I can attend to this fault, but I, I must do it wisely. And that means that aversion does not arise with this. Yeah. After all, it's really goodwill. You, know, you, have good, you have the best in mind for yourself. You, to improve yourself, to undo negative things, is a, good, is a kindly, friendly, creative thing, isn't it? It's a good thing, and you should, it should be a, an interesting and cheerful endeavor to sort this complex thing out called the mind and uh, the human conditioning. Okay, so we will... Uh, end our tea time today. I hope you all enjoyed it and um, we, you will perhaps see more of these episodes in the future. <laughs>